Hi, this is David Van Vranken here at UC Irvine in Chemistry 51C. And this, I believe, is the eighth lecture in our course. And <clears throat> I saw an article uh, that was talking about a, a new compound that somebody synthesized as part of a collaborative effort from a European group uh, to develop a component of what could be the future of quantum computing. And this is a, an important term that you're going to hear about as far as technology. You may have already been hearing about this in the media. And they had managed to hold together, using organic molecules, hold together three atoms of lanthanide elements way down from the bottom of the periodic table. Uh, erbium, cerium, and erbium. Uh, and by doing that, they're able to essentially create some quantum bits for quantum computing. And that's because these lanthanides have electrons with unpaired spin. And the spin can be up, spin can be down, and those represent ones and zeros for computing. You can use, that's the way a computer stores memory. And if you expose this to a magnetic field, the spin knows whether it's aligned or misaligned with the magnetic field. So you could potentially use systems like this uh, for information storage. But what's important about quantum computing, and this is why it's all the rage, is that if you align a string of these to represent ones and zeros, it can exist in all states at the same time, simultaneously. It's like all possible universes of states until you finally query the system somehow by bringing other atoms nearby in order to create a question for the system, a mathematical, it can represent a mathematical problem. So this idea that, um, that quantum computers or quantum bits or qubits can exist in all possible states simultaneously until, until you ask it a question uh, is what makes quantum computing so potentially fast, so much uh, faster potentially than all other possible uh, simple silicon-based uh, computers. Now, we haven't really talked much about electron spin in, in our course so far, but it, it does uh, exist in, in organic chemistry. We may have talked about nuclear spin when we talk about NMR, but let's go ahead and talk about electron spin and where that might be important. And it's certainly not important in any of the reactions that you've seen so far, because everything that we've done so far is to represent electrons as dots. But I want to remind you that each one of those dots can be associated with an electron with a spin, spin up or spin down. And we like to pair those when we put them into molecular orbitals, whether it's a non-bonding orbital or a sigma bonding orbital or a pi bonding orbital. Uh, when we put two electrons into an orbital in a molecular orbital energy diagram, kind of like the one I've got drawn at the bottom here, we like to show that those, uh, uh, those spins have, are opposite. Um, and there are quantum numbers associated with those. So it, where would you see electron spin if you wanted to talk about organic chemistry? When would it become important? Because it certainly has not been important so far. Well, well the place where you would find electron spin to be important is in photochemistry. So for example, if I take these two electrons in this non-bonding orbital right here, and I think about what they look like. They exist in an orbital, a non-bonding orbital, where one of the electrons spends half of its time in this green phased lobe here, up above here, and it spends the other half of its time in the purple lobes. And you can say the same for the electron that has opposing spin. They have this way of avoiding each other um, by existing in a phased uh, molecular orbital. Now, when if you could get this molecule to absorb a photon of light, that's the way sunscreens work, sunscreens are ketones, you would push one of the electrons from a lower energy non-bonding orbital up into a high energy pi star orbital. So that would be called an end to pi star transition. So suddenly one of the electrons that used to be over here in, in this non-bonding orbital will now be spending its time in a completely different orbital, occupying a completely different part of space. Over here where I represented it with this kind of orange lobes and then with these yellow lobes here. And so those electrons initially would keep their spin, one up, one down. But 
That's not favorable. It turns out that it is energetically more favorable if you push one of the electrons into a pi star orbital for that other electron, and, and I think I've made a little mistake here, for that other electron to now um, uh, flip its spin so that both of the spins are up. And we would refer to this as a triplet state. It has to do with quantum numbers. You don't even know, need to understand that. But the point is that if, if both of the electrons have spin up, you can now not form a bond with those two electrons <laughs> because there's some kind of a rule that says Hunt's rule or something. I don't even remember what it is because I don't usually use that. But you can't have two electrons of spin up in the same orbital to form a bond. And so what will happen with many ketones is that they will split apart to uh, undergo a radical homolysis like this and you'll generate two radicals. And initially, those two radicals know that they can't form a bond. If they're close enough for a moment in time, those spins are coupled. They recognize that they both have the same spin and cannot possibly form, sit into a bonding orbital. So you have to wait for one of these molecules to sort of float away or get jostled around or some sort of energetic motion that causes it to lose track of its spin. It's like once the other molecule is far enough away, it can't remember whether it's got the same spin or an opposing spin. And once it forgets, uh, once it's decoupled, those two electrons can now recombine and create a, a new bonding orbital and exist in the same bonding orbital. So we, we normally don't think about this. There's no reason for you to think about electron spins when we're doing uh, bromination of benzylic positions or the kinds of radical chemistry that we've done so far. Uh, but if you ever take a course that involves organic photochemistry, you'll be thinking about spin states um, um, in order to explain why some reactions can form bonds in a concerted fashion and some cannot. All right, let's go ahead and talk about the lecture. I hope we have a short lecture today because we're trying to finish up our material from chapter 20. Now, let me start off by acknowledging the fact that we just finished taking an exam. Um, it was not the best exam. <laughs> You know, we, we can see the entire class on, on, our, on the sapling homework system as you're taking the exam, you know, which questions you're getting right, which questions you're getting wrong. And it was apparent that the ones that involve mechanisms or drawing Arrhenium ion resonance structures, virtually nobody got those right, which that doesn't really help you or me if I write questions that nobody can get right. So um, it was kind of a fail on my part, but everybody took the same exam. It was kind of tough. I think the mean was 50% or just under 50%, depending on whether we count the people that didn't take the exam. Um, but I'm sure you'll do better next time. I'll, I'll write a better exam next time. And don't lose faith. Don't become demotivated by your performance on the exam. You know, we got more exams coming up where you get a chance to show your knowledge. I mean, generally, I, when I looked at it, I think you guys did great, even though it turned out to be tougher than I, I had hoped it would be. Um, so keep working problems and practicing these problem-solving tools. Now, let me come back to where we left off, because it, it, I don't know about you, but you know, it was kind of awkward this past week for us to be talking about carbonyl addition chemistry when everybody was preparing to, uh, to take an exam on electrophilic aromatic substitution and OH compounds. So I just want to remind you that we've been talking so far about additions to carbonyls, right? You take carbonyls that are parts of esters, that are parts of amides, and we add in nucleophiles to the carbonyls. This is the big theme, the major theme for the rest of this quarter. And really, for the most part, that's, that's what organic chemistry is about, is adding to carbonyl groups. And the last thing I left off with is sometimes you want to have an OH compound that you protect to keep it from reacting with an alkyl lithium or a Grignard reagent or with lithium aluminum hydride. And so we protect those compounds by converting them into silyl ethers. Um, the, so I gave you a secret recipe for converting things into silyl ethers. And, and that recipe was to treat alcohols with tert butyl dimethyl silyl chloride. You could write TBDMS chloride. You could if you're using a typewriter keyboard or if you're using a keyboard, you could write it out in this formula, italics T-butyl dimethyl silyl chloride. And you have to use a special base called imidazole. That's the conditions that have been optimized to give high yields. And you get 100% yield forming ethers. 
Siloethers are amazing. It's so easy to form them in quantitative yield. There's no E2 or E1 or any competing elimination mechanisms. You get 100% yield without worrying about competing eliminations. That's why organic chemists love to form siloethers and then cleave siloethers. And I gave you this secret formula for a reagent, tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride, that quantitatively cleaves the O silo bond, that quantitatively cleaves this bond when you're done doing Grignard chemistry or alkalithium chemistry um, or, or chemistry that's sensitive to, um, that uses super basic conditions. And, and this reagent, tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride, will quantitatively cleave that silyl ether and, and give you back in the alcohol that you started with in the very beginning. And, and this is super commonly used in organic synthesis, um, this idea of protecting things and then taking off protecting groups when you're done. Uh, there is a workup after the this tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride. The book doesn't show that, so I'm not going to ask you to show it. But obviously, the H has to come from somewhere, that H. And it comes from an aqueous workup that nobody in the book seems to want to talk about. Okay, let's move on. What else can you do with alkalithiums and organomagnesium compounds? Um, and a major, major theme of this chapter is for us to talk about what happens when we take these reagents and we add them to esters instead of ketones or, or aldehydes? So I'm going to go ahead and draw out a substrate here. And just to make it fancy, I'll, 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 make, I'll put a cyclobutane ring on there because maybe just to kind of freak us out and get you thinking outside the box. So let me draw an ester. It's an ethyl ester. If we take an alkalithium reagent or a Grignard reagent, you get the same, the same effect there. What happens? Well, first of all, if you want to get a high yield, we have to add two equivalents. I'll explain that in just a second. You, you can't do these reactions of esters uh, using just one equivalent. So if I take phenyl lithium that has that magnificently nucleophilic bond, we've got to add two equivalents. And in the United States, we write equiv. The American Chemical Society decided that EQ stands for equation and equiv stands for equivalence. So we write two equivalents of phenyl lithium and we have to follow this up with an aqueous workup. We just swamp it with water, then we're done when we're done. Let me go ahead and show you what happens. When we add alkalithiums or Grignard reagents to esters, you can't stop it from adding twice. So you end up adding one phenyl, one of your uh, organolithiums, and then another. And then the, the aqueous workup protonates the alkoxide anion, so we get a neutral molecule we can extract into organic solvents. And the ethanol is still in there. But, you know, that's going to be volatile. In, in practice, we would evaporate that along with the solvent and end up with just pure tertiary alcohol at the end of that reaction. So that's the general theme. When you take an ester and you add two equivalents of uh, an or organolithium or a Grignard reagent, uh, you end up adding twice. You cannot stop at a single addition. And this, this is going to be frustrating to you because I'm going to ask you questions where... How do you synthesize the equivalent of adding just once? And there's no way to do it by adding an alkalithium. You, you can't stop your alkalithium from adding twice, even if you add only one equivalent of alkalithium. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at another ester. I'm just going to try to make it, what can I do to try to make this look interesting? Because it looks kind of boring right now. Um, well, I'll, I'll just leave it like this. But let's go ahead and talk about adding instead. What would happen if we added a Grignard reagent? It's the same idea. I'll add ethyl magnesium chloride. Could be ethyl magnesium bromide. It could be ethyl magnesium iodide. It could be ethyl lithium. They'd all give the same product. Um, <clears throat> and so again, we have to remember to, to get a, a high yield to equivalents of, of our reagent. And then we'll follow this up with an aqueous workup. And we'll end up adding two ethyl groups. Now we're going to cleave this alcohol off of here. But again, that, that's uh, volatile enough where it would come off as we're trying to evaporate stuff. This alcohol would not be volatile enough. And so you'd be able to isolate that because it's kind of heavy. In fact, let's, let's take a substrate that's a little heavier. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> now we've got three ethyl groups on that tertiary alcohol. And so <clears throat> these would be the two products that you would get. Now we need to understand why is it that you can't stop with a single addition of just one equivalent of the Grignard reagent. Let's go ahead and take a look at the mechanism for this reaction when you add esters. Well, let me just come back to this. This is super important. 
you, I promise you, I promise you I will be asking you questions on the exam, the next exam or the final exam, I, I don't know where. Everybody who teaches, uh, every instructor of organic chemistry who teaches the last quarter will ask you to, will expect you to know how to use this reaction backwards and forwards um, as a synthetic tool in multi-step synthesis. What's the product? Draw the product in the box. That kind of question. Okay, so mechanistically, what's going on if you take an ester and you add an alkyl lithium or a Grignard reagent to that? So let me go ahead and take an example here. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to, we usually, the, the OR group is either O-methyl or O-ethyl. In most cases in organic synthesis, not always, but in most cases, and then you evaporate the methanol or ethanol at the end. That would be pretty common. Usually the, the other side, it's not acetate, it's some complex carboxylic acid derivative. So if I take a Grignard re, uh, reagent or an alkyl lithium, in this case, I'll take the ethyl magnesium chloride. Again, that's a t that you would typically buy as a bottle of reagent. Um, and if the magnesium bromide reagent is cheaper, you'd buy that one instead. <laughs> Uh, there's nothing special about that. So the first step, as always in this chapter, is we're going to attack the carbonyl. We've got this nucleophilic carbon-magnesium bond, and we're going to add that in to the carbonyl. And there we go. That's the, we just get ready to do that over and over and over again in the next four to five chapters and for the rest of this course. So we're going to make a carbon-carbon bond by doing that. Let me now draw out the ethyl group. There it is. <clears throat> And, and we'll end up with an alkoxide anion, and that magnesium chloride salt is still floating around. It's got a positive charge on the magnesium there. It's not doing anything right now. And whenever you reach this kind of an intermediate, we saw these kinds of intermediates in the reduction uh, of esters with lithium aluminum hydride. Whenever you have this kind of O minus next to an OR group or a chloride group, the OR group acts as a leaving group. Now, I know in SN2, you were taught to, to think, oh no, alkoxides can never act as leaving groups. They can never act as leaving groups in SN2 reactions. But if you have a carbanion here, or an oxygen anion there, or a nitrogen anion there, there is absolutely no problem. It is unstoppable. You can't stop this anionic lone pair from pushing out the alkoxide as a leaving group. So I realize you may not recognize that OR can be a leaving group because of all that SN2 thinking, but no problem. We're going to see this over and over happen uh, where O minuses can kick out neighboring alkoxides that are directly adjacent and attached to the same carbon atom. Okay, when we do that, we're going to end up with a new, uh, a new carbonyl, a new ketone. So pushing that back down creates a new uh, CO pi bond. Let me go and draw that ethyl group down there. And the OR group just goes, alkoxide anion just goes floating away. So we end up with this, um, <clears throat> with this ketone. And now, because the ketone is actually more reactive, this, this carbonyl right here is more reactive than the one in the ester. We're going to talk about that in a couple of chapters. Why is it that esters are less reactive than carbonyls towards, it, than ketones and aldehydes towards attack? Ketones are more reactive. So the next molecule of Grignard reagent that floats along is going to prefer to attack this carbonyl over this one. So you can't stop a second addition of, the, of, your, of your organometallic reagent in there. So let's go ahead and draw that out. So another ethyl magnesium chloride comes along and unstoppably, you can't stop this second addition here. There we go. And so that's going to lead to our, uh, let me draw that in black. That's going to lead to our, uh, the product before the workup, which would be this with two ethyl groups now attached that came from our Grignard reagent. There we go. And what else is in there? We still have that um, chloromagnesium salt. Oh, I'm running out of room there. Hope I can squeeze that into the side of the page. Um, we still have that chloromagnesium salt there. That's, you know, that's a really poorly drawn chloromagnesium. Let me put it down below uh, so that we don't, so that I don't treat it like it's, it's not there. So I'll just draw it down here, plus the chloromagnesium salt. And the other thing that I didn't keep track of was we actually have two, uh, two um, sets of alkoxide anions there. Because if you'll recall, we've got this OR group and this chloromagnesium, and then we have this alkoxide and this chloromagnesium cation. So they're both floating around in there. You, you go off and do whatever you want to do. Go get some coffee. Go get some lunch. 
come back or go, go read some science. And then when you're ready, you come and dump this, a bunch of water in there. And what that water does is it protonates all the alkoxides that are present in your solution. So let's keep track of that. What happens as we do that? So if we have this, um, we have this product that added, where we added the two ethyl groups and we swamp this with water, right? That's going to just simply, right? It, it's just an equilibrium. There's tons of water and then there's, but there's only one mole or one equivalent of the alkoxide anion. And so it just, uh, um, that's just going to pick up a proton from the water. And the equilibrium, it's an equilibrium process and the equilibrium because it's, because of excess water lies on the side of the, um, uh, of deprotonating the water. So you end up with a neutral product that you can now extract into organic solvents and evaporate off the solvent. Now also at the same time, the less interesting thing is the leaving group, the OR, which is usually uh, ethanol or methanol. So let me go ahead and just contrast this uh, to make it clear that what's also happening here is that we're also taking the OR, the alkoxide leaving group, right? That up over here, we, we had this alkoxide act as a leaving group. And so when that acts as a leaving group, that's also getting protonated by water under the conditions of the reaction. So let me go ahead and draw that out just to be clear. But again, um, that's usually not the synthetic point because we're usually going to evaporate off all of the, uh, all of this OR, which would usually be methanol or ethanol, but not always, uh, but usually. And so we just deprotonate that and that's also occurring under the conditions of the reaction uh, to give the alcohol byproduct. So let me go ahead and draw out that alcohol byproduct there. And that's, that's usually the part that we volatilize off. So when you add to ketones and aldehydes, there's no leaving group. But when we add to esters, there's an OR that can act as a leaving group after the addition of the, of the Grignard reagent or the alkylithium. Cannot emphasize enough how important that reaction is. We'll give you plenty of opportunities on our online homework system to practice that, but also the book has plenty of problems and you have to master that as a tool for synthesis um, and just know that reaction. Okay, let's take, take a look at another weird carbonyl compound that you wouldn't traditionally think of um, as useful for synthesis because it's a gas. Actually, we don't use it as a, uh, maybe I'll comment on that in just a second. Let me go ahead and take as an example, uh, phenyl magnesium bromide. It could be phenyllithium, could be phenyl magnesium chloride. I think this is the common one that we buy solutions of and have bottles of this sitting around in our laboratory. Actually, we store them in the refrigerator. And if we take this and we treat this with carbon dioxide, and the reality is we have chunks of, of dry ice, which is solid carbon dioxide sitting around in the lab because we use it to cool things down. And so we usually throw in a chunk of carbon dioxide. Let me go ahead and draw, uh, I'll go ahead and draw out the, the typical molecular formula. But let me remind you that, that that's got two carbonyl groups in it. And the end product of that, notice I'm enumerating the steps here because we have to follow this up with a workup, is not basic enough to be protonated by water. Right, normally, let me just briefly here, I'm going to change this into an H, but I'll start off by drawing a minus. If you just put water in there, it's not going to protonate that. So in this case, when we, when we add to a carbon dioxide, let me go ahead and draw the C there so you can see there's the carbon from the carbon dioxide. You, you can't protonate the carboxylate anion using water. So in this particular case, where we synthesize a carboxylate anion by addition to carbon dioxide, you have to work this up using acid. And so I'll write aqueous HCl. Uh, if you just wrote HCl, that might be easier. Um, I, I, I like to write aqueous just to make it clear. We're just doing a workup. We're not trying to use the hydrochloric acid for an SN1 process or something. We're just quickly shaking our organic solvent mixture with some aqueous HCl and let the layers separate. And in the process of doing that, you convert this uh, into, uh, uh, into uh, water. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about mechanistically what's going on. And it doesn't matter what, what, what the reagent is. If you have phenyl magnesium bromide and you have carbon dioxide, that's got two carbonyl groups on there. And those carbonyl groups are reactive just like an aldehyde, ketone, ester. So you can expect that this is going to attack. There we go. 
forms a new carbon-carbon bond, and that's going to lead to the, the carboxylate anion intermediate. So you end up with this carboxylate anion. And then when you work that up with the, with the aqueous HCl, I'm just going to write, because we're doing arrow pushing here, I'm just going to symbolize the acid as HA. I don't care whether it's H3O plus that's protonating that or HCl. You can't actually know, so that's why it's better to just symbolize this for an arrow pushing mechanism. Um, that, that we're simply protonating that with something that can serve as a, mechanistically as an acid. And so that's how you get a carboxylic acid by taking a Grignard reagent and <clears throat> and I'm just so excited because in a couple of chapters, we're going to show you like a zillion things you can do with this carboxylic acid, uh, like convert it to an acid chloride and do uh, friedel crafts reactions or, or any number of things. So get ready. You're going to be using carboxylic acids so frequently coming in a couple of chapters. Okay, that's the mechanism for that reaction. Uh, not quite as common or useful, this, this particular uh, addition of carbon dioxide as just simply adding twice to an ester, uh, but um, but still a, a useful process. Now I'm going to show you a specialized reaction, and and later in, in it may it's not super common, and so I'm a little bit scared that you're going to forget about this general process that we refer to as conjugate addition or one four addition. And so I want to contrast what happens. I'm going to start off by drawing in the middle of the page a substrate, and then I want to contrast, which means um, what's the difference? I want to contrast what happens if we add a Grignard reagent or alkylithium versus adding a type of reagent that you've never seen before and that's going to freak you out called a cuprate reagent. You've never seen a cuprate reagent before. And I don't think you're ever going to see a cuprate reagent outside of this reaction in this class. But let's go ahead and talk about what those cuprate reagents do. But first, I want to remind you what would happen if I simply took an alkylithium reagent. And it uh, doesn't really matter. Let me just put phenyl lithium here. That's going to add to the carbonyl. Well, we know that already. And we follow these up with an H2O workup because it generates an alkoxide. I, I like to write the word workup when we're just getting started on this to remind you that the water is not there to add to the alkene or some other thing. We're just trying to protonate the alkoxide intermediate here. And so we would end up with this. We would end up with a new phenyl carbon bond, and this would be protonated as the product of the reaction. That's what happens if you add a Grignard reagent, an alkylithium reagent, um, that would be the product of the reaction. But let me contrast that with a new reagent you've never seen before. And that's called a cuprate reagent. And we're just gonna, here's what it would look like if you typed it on a, uh, in the text form, R2CULI. One of the Rs will transfer, not both. You throw the other one away. So you wanna make sure you're not using super complex R groups here because you're throwing one of them away. One of them is going to add. Boy, I hope that freaks you out because you've never seen this kind of copper thing before. You've never seen copper with one bond, which would be uh, organocopper species. You've never seen a copper with three bonds, which in this case is a cuprate. Um, and so what happens when we do this? And we also follow this up with an, uh, an aqueous workup. Well, what happens is we're going to end up forming, uh, we're, we're going to end up attacking right here at this carbon atom. Not on the carbonyl. That's what alkylithiums do. Or Grignard reagents add to the carbonyl. Alkylithium reagents add to the carbonyl. But a cuprate reagent is going to add to this end here. And oftentimes, um, in synthesis, we would sometimes number these, these atoms in an enone system. When the alkene is conjugated to the carbonyl, we would refer to that as an enone. And we sometimes people would number these one, two, three, four, the atoms in that conjugated enone, one, two, three, four. So if you add to the, the carbonyl with an alkylithium, we would refer to that as one, two addition. Whereas over here with the cuprate, we're going to add to carbon four and we would call that a one four addition. Let me go ahead and draw the product before I go any further. Let's just go ahead and talk about what the product would be. In this case, the R group would add to that fourth atom in that four atom system. And after the aqueous workup, it will be completely neutral. 
let me go ahead and, I don't want to darken that bond because I don't, but look at where you add the R group from a cuprate. So we refer to that as 1,4 addition. So let me go ahead and write that out, 1,4 addition. And we're also, when later on in the course, we're going to refer to this, uh, so I'll write AKA, also known as conjugate addition, because we're adding to a conjugated enome, conjugated addition. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look mechanistically at how to think about this cuprate reagent, because uh, again, I, I don't think you've ever seen anything like this before, so it's going to be really bothersome to you. So if I take one equivalent of a Grignard reagent and I add it to copper bromide, you would form a bond. This is called an organocopper reagent. You can't buy those, they're, they're kind of sensitive and unstable. If I add a second equivalent of the alkalithium to that, so if I add two equivalents of alkalithium, the second equivalent will form another R copper bond, and you'll end up getting this, whoops, um, you'll end up getting this, when you add that second al alkalithium to the cuprate, it, the copper will become negatively charged. Just like tetrahydrotoborate, just like tetrahydrotoaluminate, and when you see that negative charge on copper, you know all, uh, and there's also a counter ion from your organolithium, when you see that negative charge on copper, all the bonds to copper are nucleophilic. So both of these alkyl copper, alkyl cuprate bonds are nucleophilic, and one of them is going to transfer to the enone. So let me go ahead and draw that out. So if I have an enone here, it just so happens, and this is what makes them useful, that this nucleophilic alkyl cuprate bond adds faster, not to the carbonyl carbon, but over here, to this carbon at this, um, we'll talk about this more later, but the, we'll, we'll refer to as the beta position. So let me watch how I push the electrons. I'm going to make this, the electrons go to the carbonyl like this. And it's kind of like attacking the carbonyl, except you don't directly attack the carbonyl. And so that's what a cuprate does. And it's not what an organolithium does. It's not what an organomagnesium compound does. That's what a cuprate does. And so you'll end up forming a bond here at this carbon at the end of that system. And we're going to get a species that is going to be the centerpiece of two full chapters in our book. This species, I, let me go ahead and give it a name that you're going to see coming up a lot. It's called an enolate. It's kind of like an alkene with an alcohol on it, which would be an enol, except it's got a negative charge on the oxygen. So it's called an enolate. Now, you'll notice that we refer to this as alpha beta the substrates is alpha beta unsaturated enones. And that's because we're going to give a special name here to the carbons that are directly attached uh, to the carbonyl carbon. The carbon positions that are directly attached, we refer to as the alpha carbon on both sides of the carbonyl. And then one further away is called the beta carbon. And we also use this nomenclature when you talk about amino acids, um, how far away from the, the carbonyl carbon of an amino acid is a substituent, there, there's such a thing as beta branched amino acids, uh, alpha substituted amino acids. Uh, so this is not just for organic chemistry, it's also used in, in biochemistry. So you'll notice uh, we break the bond at the alpha beta position and when we work this up, what's going to happen, and in order to help us understand why this happens, we're going to put a proton on the carbon atom and not on the oxygen. That's not to say you don't protonate on the oxygen, it just doesn't give you a stable um, doesn't give you a stable product. To help us understand why do we protonate here instead of on O minus, let me draw the resonance structure for this compound. The resonance structure for this would look like um, this. Let's go ahead and draw that resonance structure out. The resonance structure looks like this. Here's another way to depict the enolate, is to depict it as a carbanion. And I don't think you should be surprised, but in three chapters, in chapter 23, we're going to use these enolates to form carbon-carbon bonds. <laughs> that's what that lone pair does. So here we're going to do something that's just really sad, is we're going to just stick a proton on there. But later we'll show you, you can do the, add those carbanions, these enolate carbanions, um, and use them for SN2 reactions, addition to, um, addition to carbonyls. Uh, but for now, for this one, we're just going to protonate that. Let me do it and draw my acid here in black. So when you dump a bunch of water in there, 
that'll serve as an acid to protonate that. Um, and and um, and then we'll uh, end up isolating a neutral product here at the end of this. I'm not going to draw the new new proton that we just added here to that position. Okay, so this is what we do with cuprate reagents. We're not gonna discuss cuprate reagents, I don't think at all in the next chapter. We're not going to discuss cuprate reagents at all in the chapter after that. So you're going to tend to forget about them. Um, and in the next two chapters, we're going to talk about addition to alpha beta unsaturated enones and conjugate addition, or if you wanna call it one four addition again, but using a, a set of reagents that are different from cuprates. And I'll try to jog your memory and say, Remember several chapters ago when we talked about cuprates and you'll say, what? I don't remember that. And then the, it'll start coming back to you slowly. So this is not as common as alkylithium additions. It's not as common as, um, as Grignard addition to carbonyls. This, this conjugate addition stuff is not as common, but you need this to sort of frame your understanding for a few chapters from now. Now, uh, coming up, um, in the next few sections of the book, there's a review. Just a review of the stuff that you've learned in, in, in this chapter is, is what's in there. So I wanna just try to summarize for you, what are the powerful types of transformations that we used? Uh, not all of them, but what are, what's kind of a, a common sequence of using some of the reactions that you've learned about for carbon-carbon bond formation in organic chemistry? And that's what really gets me excited and your TA is excited and the instructors of organic chemistry excited is forming carbon carbon bonds. So let me go ahead and start off by just taking a simple substrate here and let's just imagine I wanted to make some carbon carbon bonds with that. So way down over here in the corner I'm going to draw a potential product that you could easily make if you started with an alcohol. So if I started with this alcohol that has a vinyl group on there it's no problem whatsoever to add methyl groups to that, not in one step, phenyl groups to that. Um, and so that's quite easy to do. So how do you do that? How do you do that using reactions that I have already showed you? Well, this chapter is about adding to carbonyls. So the first thing you should wanna do is take that alcohol and oxidize it to a carbonyl like an aldehyde. So let's do that. And I hope you can remember the reagent that you would use for converting primary alcohols to aldehydes. And the reagent is PCC, pyridinium chlorochromate. I'm not going to force you to know the structure of, of pyridinium chlorochromate, but you need to know that transformation because once you have an aldehyde, there's lots of things that we can do with that. Uh, and starting in this chapter with adding things like alkyl lithiums. So if I wanted to make a bond between a methyl and that carbonyl carbon, well, you use either methyl lithium or a Grignard reagent. In this case, I'll use methyl lithium. But it, you could also use methyl magnesium iodide or methyl magnesium bromide. Most of the labs here in, in, in Fred Rhinus Hall here at UC Irvine have bottles of methyl lithium and methyl magnesium bromide sitting around in the refrigerator. So you dump that in, follow it up with some water, and now you'll have this, this, um, this amazing new carbon-carbon bond, and the water converts that to a neutral product. You'll get, I'm just going to write, um, I'll just write racemic here. And I always tell you to acknowledge the existence of stereoisomers. So we would actually generate that as a racemic mixture. I'm not going to draw them for now. So, um, but I'm just going, going to acknowledge that we generate a mixture of two enantiomers in that process. Now, once we've got this, we can keep going. How do I make another carbon-carbon bond? Well, I need to convert this OH alcohol back to a carbonyl. So let's try to imagine if we took this product of that of that two-step transformation and we treat it with PCC again you could use chromic acid here but I'm too late whoops but I'm too lazy to write all that stuff out for chromic acid so I'm just going to write PCC and that efficiently oxidizes this back to a ketone in this case it oxidizes it to an enone if I want I could use one of those cuprate reagents to add to the end but that's not what we're doing here we're trying to make a phenyl carbon bond and so how would I make a phenyl carbon bond well let's add we could add phenyl lithium, or I, um, I could add phenyl magnesium bromide. I'll just add phenyl lithium again, since I've already started using alkyl lithiums. Uh, 
we don't want to isolate or get a flask full of alkoxide, so we work, we protonate the O minus at the end. Um, and, and this is how you now make, add the phenyl to that. So you need to get used to this idea of adding carbon nucleophiles to aldehydes, ketones, and esters. Adding carbon, powerful carbon nucleophiles to carbonyl groups. That's the way we make bonds in organic synthesis. And if you don't have a carbonyl group, make one. You take an alcohol and oxidize it with PCC. I, I guess in some cases you could use chromic acid. Um, it's easy to make a, a carbonyl group. That's what the, that whole chapter 12, or at least one of the main themes of chapter 12 was take alcohols and oxidize them to carbonyls so that you can do more chemistry with those. So um, <clears throat> that's the end of chapter 20. And this is our start of carbonyl chemistry. Our next chapter will involve carbonyl chemistry. The chapter of the, after that will involve carbonyl chemistry, adding things to carbonyls. And the chapter after that will involve more carbonyl chemistry. <laughs> so get used to, to working problems and uh, applying these powerful tools involving carbonyl compounds. Uh, just really super exciting stuff. We're finally really getting to the meat of organic chemistry. Um, and uh, take advantage of, of the problems in the book. Take advantage of the online homework system to get practice uh, using these powerful tools. All right, I will see you guys on on Friday.